Yeah, so we can start. So I'll just uh, officially I'll just start. I welcome you, Dr. Laurie, Professor Laurie, in fact. And uh, uh, so Dr. Aparna, one of our co-hosts, she will be telling something about ACBR, why, how we are doing this FBR series, and uh, what is the main aim. So she will brief you a little about ACBR and this FBR series, and then we can start with your lecture after that. Yes, Dr. Okay. Aparna. Okay, thank you, Dr. Minakshi. Uh, Professor Laurie, we already started talking, but uh, I express my gratitude to you for accepting our invitation for the talk today. And uh, uh, our center, which is uh, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar Center for Biomedical Research, came into existence in March 1991. And if I'm correct, the first master's batch started in 1998. Uh, we have uh, high quality postgraduate education um, as well as research. So, uh, and everything is in biomedical sciences. So we have doctoral training, postdoctoral training, and then we have a very unique program and this is for undergrads. So that's a summer undergraduate research program, which is a unique program and mostly only the master's students and you know the senior people are acquainted with research. But this is for undergraduate students and it's a very competitive program. Uh, students from all over India, 300 to 400 applications we receive every year and then we select 25 students and then they undergo lab training. So in that age only, they are acquainted with the research environment. And then they also listen to you know uh, talks from eminent speakers. So this is one unique thing about ACBR that we have this program. Uh, the other thing about our center is that um, we have amalgamation of two subjects, chemistry and biology, both in teaching as well as research. Research. And our research is basically in the field of human health um, as well as the disease related to it. So, um, as far as I'm not going to the detail, but uh, our master's program is a very good program with a very good coursework in uh, that includes organic chemistry, medicinal chemistry, pharmacology, toxicology, immunology, human physiology, genomics, molecular oncology. You talk about a subject, and we have that in the coursework. <laughs> Uh, so uh, the students, you know, know each and everything. Of course, we have made it focused and uh, we also provide, you know, fellowships to MSc students, meritorious MSc students. Uh, we are 12 faculties in ACBR and we have a lot of students enrolled in the master's program every year. And our uh, research includes, again, like our teaching course, uh, every, the molecular pathology of infectious diseases, lifestyle disorders and uh, molecular oncology, immunology, neurobiology, bioinformatics, system biology, drug discovery. So you name it and you're doing all kind of research. Uh, uh, also, of course, currently several faculties are involved in the uh, you know, SARS-CoV-2 research. We have a small center, but uh, we have all sorts of you know, scientific instruments, animal facility. We also have our own bioinformatics center, and uh, which is actually funded by one of the funding agencies in India, which is the uh, Department of Biotechnology. And we really appreciate collaborative research. We uh, collaborate among ourselves. We also collaborate with um, people in uh, Delhi, different institutes in Delhi, outside Delhi, and of course, outside India also. And uh, uh, of course, our students are known uh, to have, you know, brought fame to our center uh, by getting several travel awards and other awards. And our uh, faculties have also received several prestigious uh, awards. And uh, our director, Dr. Daman Soluja, she is the one who is receiving, you know, the most awards. She received the most prestigious award, uh, uh, the President Award for Biotech Product and Process Development and Commercialization. She has also developed a cost-effective diagnostic essay for um, sexually transmitted infections, two of them, uh, Miseria gonorrhea, which is quite relevant to your talk, and uh, Amidia tr trachomatis. And of course, uh, her lab has also developed a PCR-based SARS-CoV-2 diagnostic kit, which is based on lab on chip platform. Uh, the other thing uh, which is new to our department is that, and in, of course uh, new to the University of Delhi, is that uh, our university has been recognized as the Institute of Eminence by the Ministry of HRD. And our director, Dr. Daman Suluja, is also the joint director for Delhi Institute of Public Health, uh, which is one of the schools under the ages of IOE. And the good thing is she's actively involved in in expanding the research activities, uh, not only the basic and translational, but public health related uh, research activities also. So coming to the FBR series, we have been you know, conducting several uh, national and international symposia to share our research findings. And this FBR, which is Frontiers in Biomedical Research is one of them. 
we used to have it uh, every year earlier, but then we started doing it all the next year. And this year, uh, fortunately or <laughs> unfortunately, we are having this virtual webinar series, which is a boon in disguise, uh, because we are having you know several faculties, eminent speakers, um, uh, talking about different topics in biomedical research, including SARS-CoV-2. And this started in April 2021. So uh, uh, probably I should stop here. And uh, without further delay, I again welcome Professor Laurie to our FBR webinar series. And um, uh, now I'll request Dr. Sanjay. I hope Dr. Minakshi, Dr. Sanjay is introducing. No, 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 no. Thank you, Dr. Aparna, for okay. such a short and crisp uh, introduction. <laughs> and now I'll invite uh, Professor Daman Siruja to uh, introduce uh, Professor Laurie. And then we can start. The Ma'am, you are on mute, ma'am. Daman, ma'am. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so it was a great uh, snapshot given by Dr. Aparna Dixit of ACBR and uh, of the FBR. Uh, I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Professor L Laurie Sinder to all of you. She is from Kingston University, UK. She did her uh, PhD in microbiology and molecular gen genetics in, uh, from Emory University. Uh, and she is a MSc, BSc in biology from the College of Williams and Mary and uh, had been uh, actively involved in research since then uh, uh, from her PhD period and continued in microbiology. She has various articles, papers, books, uh, almost numbering to more than 110. And uh, she is also on the editorial board of um, several prestigious uh, uh, journals like Microbio Microbial Genomics. She is member of uh, editorial board member of Microorganisms, Prokaryotic uh, Division Committee member of Microbiology Society. And she is also in the organizing committee where they decide on the themes of the, uh, you know, forthcoming uh, um, uh, meetings like microbio of the microbiology society and she has professional affiliation to all the uh, you know scholarly uh, uh, societies microbiology society society for applied microbiology british society for antimicrobial chemotherapy european society of clinical microbiology and infectious diseases biochemical society in addition uh, to these uh, brief, uh, you know, her professional, uh, this thing, uh, she is very actively involved in teaching the uh, BSc and MSc students. And her, uh, the, it looks like the, you know, the system is very much like uh, India because we inherited a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, from the Britishers, uh, our university uh, uh, hierarchy and portfolio, I would say. So uh, her lab is actively, uh, you know, involved in uh, um, research on Neisseria species, especially Neisseria gonorrhoeae and Neisseria meningitis, both of which are pathogenic. Neisseria gonorrhoeae is uh, sexually transmitted in causes sex sexually transmitted infections, which many of you would know because my lab also works. And uh, another uh, disease that it causes new. Uh, uh, this uh, ophthalmia neonotrium, which causes neonatal blindness. Uh, it was a big problem uh, a decade back in India also, but now it has uh, decreased to a very large extent. Uh, uh, only in few areas we see uh, neonatal blindness due to Neisseria gonorrhoeae. Neisseria meningitis, I think uh, many of you have heard of meningitis due to Neisseria and, and it causes septicemia, which are both are life threatening um, uh, conditions. Uh, not, she doesn't stop here only to look into that. Neisseria has been declared as one of the, uh, you know, multi drug resistance as, uh, organism and uh, a, a, a really a pathogen of great concern. So she, they are also working on antimicrobial resistance in Gonaria and trying to find out and look for uh, new antibiotics which could help uh, uh, 
uh, in combating Neisseria infection. In fact, for neonatal uh, blindness or uh, ophthalmological uh, infections, they have developed a uh, novel antimicrobial uh, drop uh, which stops infant blindness from, uh, from multidrug resistance bacterial infection. And this has been uh, very well, you know, particularly uh, advertised and also, you know, has really helped people a lot. Her group is also involved in bacterial genomic sequences uh, to uh, uncover information about the related pathogen. And that is what I think uh, she is going to emphasize in today's talk on genomic evidence of sharing and competition between Neisseria species. That's what is her uh, topic of uh, today's talk. And I'm sure we will hear more about it uh, from uh, Professor Laurie. Professor Laurie, the platform is your. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Well, thank you. Um, and thank you um, to, to everyone for inviting me. Thank you especially to Ravi, who I met many years ago now at a nice area conference um and has thank you been, so much Dr. Lori. thank you so a, much a thank great you. friend in the field and has been persistent about uh trying to get me to to do a seminar for you so um i want to see about how Pleasure. I can get, thank you <laughs> get my presentation to show here so let's put my slideshow on oh see how that's gonna work oh it's just disappeared <laughs> There. Is that showing my presentation? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yes, great. It's, it's <laughs> okay. Um, yes, so my research group um, kind of has two focuses, and one of them is is very much on genomics, and I've decided to present to you about genomics today um, because of, of my my passion for genomics, but also because I know um, that Ravi has a, a shared passion for genomics as well, and I thought that would be great to, to present to you about my um, investigations in my research group about Neisseria genomics, but as also was mentioned in that great introduction, my research group also looks at antimicrobial agents, particularly that are used um, against Neisseria because of that horrible antimicrobial resistance in the Neisseria species um, that we see. And we're looking at fatty acid, fatty acid derivatives, and some other antimicrobial compounds that can be used against Neisseria, but also against other bacterial species. And we have a great review about fatty acids um, and monoglycerides that are anti antimicrobial. So they are antibacterial, antiviral, um, and we've done then some research papers about the Neisseria uh, antimicrobials. So if you've got any questions about those, I could take questions about those at the end, but my talk is gonna focus on our genomic research. So to start out, I'm going to talk to you about a different sort of population, and it's not a bacterial population that I want to talk about. So back in a while ago now, back in 2011, I started a collaborative project to investigate carriage of Neisseria meningitidis in Kingston University students. So there have been quite a few studies looking at carriage of Neisseria meningitidis. Now, normally, the meningococcus um, isn't really a pathogen. It's it's uh, the, the Neisseria gonorrhea is a professional pathogen. It's always causing disease, whereas my Neisseria meningitidis, when it causes disease, it causes horrible, devastating disease. As you heard in the introduction, it causes meningitis, it causes septicemia, and these are fatal, devastating diseases. But for most of the time, it can live just harmlessly in the nasopharynx. And so we have the carriage of the meningococcus in our nasopharynx, and then it's spread by droplets in the population, but in, in a lot of us, it's not causing disease, it's just sitting in the back of our throats, not doing anything. So there have been these carriage studies, particularly of university students. So that 
well, I work at a university, <laughs> let's um, do some throat swabs of our students and see if we can get some meningococci and look at them. And we had just acquired an ion torrent genome sequencer. So I thought if we do some throat swabs of our students at three different time points, could I see ch changes in the genome over those time points of a meningococcus that we just happened to catch in these students? And that was kind of my, my hope in this experimental design. But looking at the volunteer responses from our Kingston University students, I found that they weren't really high in the risk factors that were typically seen in those other university student studies from previously. When you look at studies from, say, the University of Nottingham and from other studies looking at military people who are living in military dorms, typical university student behavior kind of things you see from Hollywood movies of university students and, and from these studies done previously, the high risk factors. You have students who are living in dorms in close quarters. Well, we had some of that. Um, but then the student activities were students who went out partying a lot, drinking, smoking, kissing lots of different people on the same week. These weren't the sort of activities our students were involved in. They didn't have a lot of these high risk factors. So that was kind of the first sign that possibly we weren't gonna get any meningococci. So looking at our results, isolation and gram staining from the colonies that we had on the plates from these 64 volunteers where we'd taken samples on three separate occasions, there was just one with gram negative cocci. So it was a bit lower than we were expecting. I also at the same time investigated six students from Royal Holloway. It's a nearby university. They're both in Southwest London. They're, we're in the kind of the leafy suburbs of London, not central London, but we're in the kind of greater London area. So six students all living in the same dorm. So they're all in the same dorm area. They're all first year students. But these I sampled more times throughout their first year. So I thought it's a smaller cohort, but we're going to get them more times. And here we did identify one volunteer with gram negative cocci. So I had something to look at for gram negative cocci. And interestingly, these two volunteers each yielded two distinct isolates. And so I then embarked on doing some laboratory investigations and some genome sequencing to see what we could learn from these, these isolates. So the laboratory investigations of these isolates. Now remember, I've got four isolates. Interestingly, we've got two isolates from a Kingston University student, and these two isolates came from the, a throat swab taken at the same time. So two isolates from the same niche at the same time and two isolates that came from a Royal Holloway student, again, collected at the exact same time. These were grown on GC auger plates with Kellogg and iron supplements in 5% CO2. So this is our standard lab media for growing Neisseria in research labs. There's no selection on this whatsoever. So we're not selecting for pathogenic Neisseria. We're just trying to grow some Neisseria. And I know from, from personal experience, Lots of bacteria love to grow on this media. It's a really rich media. From doing my PhD, we kept these plates side by side in the cold room with LB plates. And sometimes, a bit tired, even though they're labeled really well, you go to, to do some culturing and you might grab an LB plate instead of a GC plate. Neisseria will not grow on the LB, but E. coli is really happy to grow on the GC plates. So lots of things will grow on a GC plate. And we did see that. We saw lots of different um, different species were growing on these plates, um, but we were able to get some gram-negative diplococci, and in fact, these were oxidase and catalase positive. So that told us straight out, we've got some Neisseria, but we don't know what species they are. So the first step in identifying them in the lab was to do API strips. So you might know from doing, uh, doing some practical lab classes maybe that you can use API strips. Usually for our students, we do them for things like E. coli. So students tend to think that all API strips are the same and they're just for E. coli, but there's a whole range of API strips that you can buy that help you do the biochemical tests 
that can tell you the different species that bacteria may be. So these are specifically for looking for different types of Neisseria species, and you can do some other species on them as well. But they're not the API st strips that you would use for identifying different types of E. coli, for example. So we've got these API strips, and as part of that flow chart, for the API strips to work out which Neisseria species. The API protocol also tells you you need to grow them on um, blood agar to assess hemolytic activity. And you also need to get a kit to look at the ability of the isolates to reduce nitrates. So we did all of that. And for our two Kingston University isolates, we also looked at what the colonies look like on the media. So what the colonies look like when growing on these GC auger plates. And comparing them to what we looked at for, for our usual lab strains of Neisseria gonorrhea. So the colony sizes, the first Kingston University isolate was larger than we were used to seeing, whereas the second one was medium normal size. The first isolate had smooth round colonies and the second were slightly granular, but still round. The first isolate had a moist glistening surface, so that smooth surface was also moist and glistening, whereas the second had a rougher surface, so the slightly granular surface was rough. But they both produced a yellowish pigment. So they're distinctly different, came from the same person, isolated at the same time, but they looked different on the plate. Now, with my kind of Neisseria knowledge, I thought, well, okay, Different colonies can look different, but still be the same strain due to phase variation that can occur. So they can be phenotypically different, but genotypically they're the same and they're actually the same strain. So we were a bit cautious to make sure that, okay, these could still be the same and they just look different. Um, so we, we were taking them forward as two different things, but thought they could still be the same thing. We'll find out. <laughs> Uh, the Royal Holloway isolates, we have small looking colonies versus medium looking colonies. They both, both made quite round colonies that were glistening on the surface, but one was unpigmented and the other was pigmented. So again, that could be something to do with a phase variation event. We, we didn't know at this point. Looking then at the features of the isolates, doing the, the testing, the kind of assessments, um, that were recommended in the API strips. We found that none of them were hemolytic, therefore they're not Neisseria enamoralis. So that's kind of the defining factor for that species. There are none of them were those. Looking at the nitrate reduction, that's negative for all four isolates. So that ruled out a whole bunch of other commensal Neisseria species. So a bunch of the non-pathogenic Neisseria species. It's not any of those. All four of them grew well at 35 degrees, and according to the API criteria, that means that they're not Neisseria gonorrhea. Now, this is kind of a bit of, of contention. There are some instances, when you look in the literature, there are some instances of gonococcal strains that will grow at 35. I think the point here is that's a strain by strain basis, and that whether they will grow or they'll grow well at, nine, at 35 is kind of the issue there. But that isn't the only defining factor of whether they're gonococcus or not. There are other indicators on the API strip that tell you Neisseria gonorrhea. So that's just one of the tests that you do for gonorrhea. Given all the criteria of the API strip, it was clear that the first Royal Holloway isolate um, was identified uh, as Neisseria cinerea. So that gave a quite clear biochemical test and the other um, defining factors with the hemo hemolytic tests, the nitrate reduction, et cetera. That's Neisseria cinerea. The other three isolates, however, could only be identified as Neisseria species. So we did all of that and we're still back to, well, it's oxidase catalase positive and it's a gram negative diplococcus. So it's Neisseria species. So we didn't know much more than, than when we started. So we moved on to looking at the genome sequence results. So genome sequencing to reveal more about it. So when we first started this, of course, we had our ion torrent sequencer, and we did some ion torrent sequencing, and we did some analysis of, of the data from that. Um, and we had a few students in the lab who did some analysis with that data, and that looked quite interesting. 
but also as time progressed on, the University of Birmingham set up their facilities as Microbes NG, and they were offering aluminumiseq sequencing for a really great price. So for under 100 pounds, you could send away your samples and they'll return the sequence data. So we thought, well, we'll just do that. We can get some more sequence data from that. And that turned out to be great. I think, you know, anytime you can send away your sequence and, and get back less than 100 contigs, you're doing really well. And if it's under 20 contigs, that's phenomenal. I mean, if you can get one contig in a circular bacterial chromosome, that's great. You can start looking at chromosomal rearrangements and all sorts of other things. Um, but that comes a bit later. Um, so there's our four isolates, and we got predicted chromosomal sizes, what we would expect for Neisseria. So a Neisserial chromosome is usually about two megabases, a bit larger for most of them, 2.2. Um, something like a Neisseria cinerea is a little bit smaller. So that fits with the very first row Holloway isolate there because it had been identified as Neisseria cinerea. And that's actually a smaller number of contigs as well. So it's a really nice genome uh, data there. So using that data, we were then able to go into looking at species identification from the sequence data. So we looked first at kind of traditional 16S ribosomal RNA using the NCBI 16S BLAST tool. The first Kingston University isolate came up as being Neisseria perflava. Now there's been a rejigging of how perflava is identified, and now it's a biovar of Neisseria subflava. So that's actually now just going to be called Neisseria subflava. The second Kingston University isolate came up as being Neisseria perflava, so that's subflava, or Neisseria cinerea. Now I think if it was going to be cinerea, the results were quite clear for a cinerea on the the laboratory results. So I think that's probably more likely to be a nice serious subflava from that 16S ribosomal RNA. Looking at the Royal Holloway results, the first one comes up as a nice serious cinerea or a nice serious meningitidis. Now, again, if it was going to be a nice serious meningitidis, it would have shown on the API strips as being a meningococcus. Also, there are other key uh, sequences that we would see in the sequence data that would show us that it's definitely a meningococcus, which we don't see. So the fact that this says cinerea as an option on the 16S, and we had all of those lab tests that said it's definitely cinerea, this is more supporting evidence that the first Royal Holloway isolate is Neisseria cinerea. And then we have the second Royal Holloway, which is suggesting that it's a Neisseria subflava which is the, that biovar perflava now. So the other test that we then decided to do with the sequence is looking at ribosomal MLST. So rather than looking at the sequence of the 16S ribosomal RNA locus, we, the, this um, PubMLST tool looks at the ribosomal proteins. So it's many more bits of sequence in the chromosome to look at what species it could possibly be. The first Kingston University isolate was then identified as possibly being Neisseria fluvescens, Neisseria mucosa, or Neisseria subflava. So there's a bit of support more for subflava that agrees with the 16S, but suggests it could also be fluvescens or mucosa. The second Kingston University isolate, it throws in another species. Um, so this could now be, based on 16S, could be subflava, could be cinerea, but probably not from the biochemistry, or could be mucosa. So I have no idea. <laughs> um, more support for cinerea for the first Royal Holloway isolate. And then for the Royal Holloway, the, the second isolate, it looks the same as the first Kingston University isolate. Could be fluvescence, could be mucosa, could be subflava. So more support for subflava based on what the 16S said, could, that it could be subflava. So we did some more. Uh, investigations with that sequence data to see if we can get some more support for something else for those two Kingston University isolates and for that second Royal Holloway isolate. So I did something a little bit different. So we did the kind of the traditional 16S, we did the, the ribosomal MLST. 
The next thing I did was look at the DNA uptake sequences. So several bacterial species have uptake sequences, which mean that naturally competent bacteria are able to preferentially take up DNA from the environment that looks like itself. So it'd be the most useful DNA that's around uh, because there'll be enough homologous sequence that it might be something to, to incorporate to either repair a bit of damage or take in something new that would be useful. And in the Neisseria, this is a 12-base DNA sequence. But interestingly, there are dialects of this 12-base sequence that vary by species. So although it's a 12-base sequence, there are slight differences between the species on these 12 base sequence. So you can look at a 12 base sequence and say, oh, this looks like it's one that's come from Neisseria gonorrhea. So if you look at a genome sequence of Neisseria gonorrhea, almost all of the DNA uptake sequences look the same, but there might be some that look just a little bit different. And then you can look at that region and say, oh, this region has probably come from one of the commensal species. And there's then been a horizontal gene transfer event of this region of the chromosome from another Neisseria species, which is a great tool for us to be able to use. So that let's see if we can use this to tell us a bit more about this species. So the first Kingston University isolate has 2009 copies of DUSBAR1, also called AGDUS. And the second Kingston University isolate has 2,393 copies of DUSBAR1, AGDUS. And if we skip down a little bit on the slide, DUSBAR1, AGDUS, is often found in Neisseria subflava, Neisseria flavescens, and Neisseria elongata. Now, Neisseria elongata, we would have been able to identify really early on looking at these down the microscope because Neisseria elongata isn't a diplococcus. These are little stumpy rods. So we would have seen rather than little cocci under the microscope, we would have seen little tiny stumpy rods. They're, they're still diplo, so they're still kind of stuck to each other, but they're not uh, cocci shaped. So we know it's not Neisseria elongata. So we're looking at either Neisseria subflava or Neisseria flavescens. So it's, it's matching up with what we're seeing from the other results from the 16S from the ribosomal MLST. Looking at the Royal Holloway results, the first one has 1,158 copies of the classic dust, the AT dust. And that is most often found in Neisseria cinerea, Neisseria lactamica, Neisseria gonorrhea, and Neisseria meningitis. So further support for Neisseria cinerea as the species for that first Royal Holloway. And the second Royal Holloway has 1,957 copies of the dust of R1, the AG dust. So that again can be Neisseria subflava or Neisseria flavescence. Well, we're still a bit up in the air. We don't have a definitive species for three of these isolates. So finally, we've done a pub MLST complete genome uh, analysis of our complete genomes, well, not completely assembled, but as complete as they're getting for most of things, um, against some complete genomes in PubMLST, looking at um, the phylogenetic tree and how they fall out. And you can see with the blue arrows, those are our four isolates. And at the top are the two Kingston University isolates, and they're closer, closest to some a subflava strain and down the bottom is the Royal Holloway isolate that wasn't yet identified, and that's very close to a subflava strain. So we've identified these then as Neisseria subflava, and in the middle there is that Neisseria cinerea isolate that we had from Royal Holloway. So we have some species now, and now we can start looking at um, how they align with these. And this is my favorite tool. This is a MAUV genome sequence aligner. So this is freely available to download, and it works on just about any computer. I've had students who've had really old laptops, and they've been able to download this and use it. It just runs slow, <laughs> um, and it'll align two genome sequences. It will align multiple genome sequences. It just runs more slowly the more genome sequences you add to it. I mean, I wouldn't. I wouldn't try probably more than 20 because then it's just harder to see what, what you're looking at. But you can align genome sequences one against another and zoom in as close as you need to to the DNA level, or you can zoom out to look at the whole genome, which is what we've got here. 
it takes the circular bacterial um, chromosome and looks at it as, as you would look at it downloaded from GenBank as a linear file and aligns the two of them there, um, looking at the regions of similarity. So colored in there with the different colors, those are regions that are similar to each other. They're not the genes, those are just regions of DNA. When you zoom in, if you take in a file that includes an annotation, you can see the annotated coding sequences. So you can see where those coding sequences fit within the regions that are similar to one another. And you can see where there's gaps. So there's maybe regions of difference or there's regions where the homology at the DNA level isn't um, as high as it is in other areas. So what we have in panel A is the first Kingston University isolate that is aligned with Neisseria subflava M18660. And you can see that over the length of that chromosome, that does align very well with that Neisseria subflava. So we've identified that very well with subflava. And the second is the other Kingston University isolate aligned with the same Neisseria subflava. And so that's aligning there well. And down the bottom is the second row Holloway isolate aligning with the same subflava there as well. And in the middle at the panel C, that is the first row Holloway isolate aligning with Neisseria cinerea NCTC 10294. So we've got the species, they're aligning well. We're able to then use this MOV tool to investigate regions of difference and regions of similarity with some of these reference strains for the different species. So we looked at some interesting common features in the data. So the sequences for the majority of the PILIS genes are present in all four of the isolates. So PILI are important for attachment to the host cells. So it would have been important in these isolates for attaching to the, the nasopharynx, to so the backs of the throats when we took those throat swabs. And the pill and glycosylation gene sequences were also identified in all four isolates. So not only are these isolates producing pili for attachment, but they're also decorating those pili, which means that they're able to then avoid immune recognition probably is what, what's going on there. An interesting feature, we identified capsule loci in the three Neisseria subflava. And we tend to think about capsule as what defines Neisseria meningitidis. It's what makes it this horrible pathogen. It's what separates it from Neisseria gonorrhea. Neisseria meningitis has a capsule, Neisseria gonorrhea doesn't. Yes, Neisseria gonorrhea causes disease all the time, but it doesn't kill us, right? But Neisseria meningitis, it has a capsule, which means when it gets into the blood, it survives in the blood, it can cross the blood brain barrier, causes meningitis, causes sepsis. It's because of its capsule. That's what we've thought about for so long. And then the more we've started sequencing the commensal, the non-pathogenic Neisseria, the more we realize that actually they have capsules too. And this harkens back even to research that I did during my postdoc, where we looked at microarray data and discovered that actually there's a lot of what we call virulence genes that are in these commensal, these non-pathogenic Neisseria. So it's, it's not necessarily what genes they have, it's what they're doing with them. It's when they're expressed, it's what they're doing with these genes that's what's making the pathogens the pathogens. And the non-pathogens are just able to, to hang out in, in our bodies and, and not cause us horrible diseases, yeah, apart from some rare instances where, you know, is it them or is it us that's, that's causing the problem? Uh, so, so yes, so we've got these, these capsules I identified in the three Neisseria subflava that we have sequenced from these individuals. In the Royal Holloway isolate, the Neisseria cinerea, it has a capsule null lo locus like we would see in Neisseria lactamica. And there's a contact break in one of our Neisseria subflavas in the capsule locus. However, in the other two sequences, um, those sequences just happen to be contiguous. So it's the whole sequence all the way through on one contig. We can see the whole of the capsule locus just fortuitously. That happens to be how the Illumina sequence came out. So we can analyze the whole thing. And this is what it looks like. So that contig break, you can see there is that double line in the second line there. 
Um, but otherwise, um, you can see the whole region between galley and tex, and that tends to be how we look at a capsule locus. It's between these two flanking defining genes, galley and tex. Down at the very bottom, that CNL is capsule null locus. That's what you might see in a Neisseria lactamica, for example, that doesn't have any capsules. So that's a, a commensal, common commensal Neisseria, Neisseria lactamica. There's no capsule genes in between. Right above that, NMA, that's a Neisseria meningitis zero group A. So that's the typical capsule loci that we're used to seeing in a pathogen in Neisseria meningitidis. And between galley and tex in yellow are the CTR, the CTR A, B, C, and D. Those are the capsule transport genes. And CSA, A, B, C, and D, those are the capsule defining genes. So that's what the capsule looks like that makes it serogroup A. So in serogroup B, C, the other serogroups of the meningococcus that you may have heard about for the different um, vaccines against Neisseria meningitidis, those are all defined by those kind of brick red genes there being transcribed to the left. So when we look at our Neisseria subflava three isolates there, the two from Kingston University and the one from Royal Holloway, we see that the yellow genes, the CTR A, B, C, and D are all there. So the transport genes are all there, but the capsule defining genes, those are there as well. And they're slightly different between each of the three isolates. So we didn't find that, that we have Neisseria subflava and they're all the same. We've got three different isolates that all have slightly different capsule defining genes. Some more interesting specific features in the data. So in the pathogenic Neisseria, Neisseria gonorrhea and Neisseria meningitidis, we have type four secretion system in the gonococcal genetic island. So during my postdoc, I did again some microarray analyses and discovered that the gonococcal genetic island, which had been defined in Neisseria gonorrhea as this type four secretion system, was actually present in some Neisseria meningitidis. Now they, they were present in the weird zero groups of Neisseria meningitidis. So not the ones we typically um, hear about or associate with disease, but some of the outliers. Um, but it was still, it was present in the meningococcus. So called the gonococcal genetic island, but present in some meningococci. And this island is, is capable of being not only in the chromosome, but of excising from the chromosome and being present as kind of this extra chromosomal circle that pops in and out of the chromosome. So this type four secretion system is known in pathogenic Neisseria. But when we're looking at these sequences, these, these four commensals, I found then a sequence of a different, a distinct type four secretion system in the genome data for the second Kingston University isolate. It has absolutely no similarity between the, this type four secretion system in the Kingston University isolate and the gonococcal genetic island. They're very different type four secretion systems, although they're both encoding the same type of system. And there are some similar type four secretion systems in some Neisseria subflava in the databases. So it's not completely novel. It's not only in my isolate. There are some other subflavas that have this type four secretion system, but it hasn't been explored before. We also were able to identify some CRISPR loci using CRISPR finder and CRISPR minor in the KU isolates. And in the Rival Holloway isolates, we found some Cas protein homologs. Our most exciting, most interesting, I think, finding from all of these isolates was a type six secretion system. The sequences for that in the subflava isolates. So type six secretion system, um, you've, you've probably heard of things like the type three secretion system, which are used to attack host cells. They're a big virulence factor for bacterial pathogens attacking host cells and causing disease. Type six secretion systems, when they were discovered, were believed very much to be similar to type three secretion systems and attacking host cells. But as they were researched more in depth, it was actually discovered that they're, they're there more to attack other bacterial cells and involved in niche competition with competitor bacterial cells. Yes, they can attack host eukaryotic cells, they can attack fungus, fungal cells, 
but their primary role is niche competition, attacking other bacterial cells. And what it looks like evolutionarily, you can see in the bottom left, that's an image from my textbook, Bacterial Genetics and Genomics, that they've taken a bacteriophage, turned it around in the membrane, and are using it as a weapon against other bacterial cells to, to stab at them with the tail of a bacteriophage that's been modified evolutionarily to, uh, in, to use effector proteins, toxins, against competitor bacterial cells. And of course, when you've got these toxins that you're secreting out, that you're, you're putting into other bacterial cells, you've got to make then an immunity protein so you don't kill yourself with your own toxins. Um, so these systems have got not only the mechanism to fire off these, these toxins into the other cells using this type six secretion system mechanism on the surface, but also the, the toxin effectors and resulting immunity proteins. So that's shown there on the bottom right of the slide, the type six secretion system apparatus. And you can see in purple on the tip of that apparatus, the VGRG protein, which loads up the, the effector proteins, the toxin proteins to take out the competitor cells. So there's always at least one VGRG uh, gene in the, the chromosome. And then frequently there's more than one because they load up different toxins. So being able to identify the effector proteins and the immunity proteins in the chromosome was one of the things we wanted to do. We worked quite closely with the Sarah Colthurst at the University of Dundee. Once we'd identified that we had a type six secretion system, we went kind of to one of the experts in type six secretion to say, ah, what are we doing? Um, can you help us sort out what's happening with our system? And her group was phenomenal in helping us identify that we had a complete system and how to find the effector and immunity proteins. And then my PhD student, um, Alan Calder said, I can't quite work out how many VGRG proteins we have because they're, they're quite similar to one another and they're repeated around the chromosome. And as anyone who's worked with genome sequence data will know if you have something that's there in multiple copies and you're trying to do an assembly, that tends to be where the assembly falls down. And you get to the end of a contig and if the VGRG is at the end of the contig and that's where the contig breaks are, then you know that that's what the problem is. That's where it's causing issues with your assembly. And that's where you go, well, I don't really know how many VGRGs there are. And Alan came to me and said, could we maybe get a min ion sequence of one of the isolates so that I could get an accurate count of VGRGs and do the effector analysis, you know, robustly. And that was about all the excuse that I needed to get a, a min ion sequence done for one of our isolates. At the time, uh, Microbes NG was just starting to offer their enhanced genome sequencing, uh, where they do a min ion sequence alongside the Illumina sequence and get you a combined sequence. And this is just the most gorgeous picture for me. Uh, when, when I started doing genome sequence analysis in with the, the first bits of data coming through from Nicira gonorrhea, from Dave Dyer's lab to Bill Schaefer's lab, who was my PhD supervisor um, in, in the 90s. <laughs> um, that was when in the days when you didn't stop doing genome sequencing until you got a complete closed circle. And we've kind of had these days where we've just been working with drafts and we've just been working with incomplete sequences since then. And now we're back to being able to get these one contig, one complete closed circular genome. And this just makes me so happy to be able to see my, my, my complete chromosome there. And then Alan was able to do an analysis and look at what's happening with the type six secretion system. And what he found was the core type six secretion system gene cluster, which makes that secretion system mechanism, the, that multi-protein complex in the membrane of the bacteria is present in two gene clusters in the chromosome, which we kind of expected from the, the draft genome that we, we had. So there's the two clusters there. What we didn't expect is that actually one of those clusters is, is copied. So there's a nearly identical copy of one of the clusters elsewhere on the chromosome. So we hadn't spotted this. I mean, 
yeah, you, sometimes you can spot these things by looking at the coverage of um, the, some of the contigs and say, oh, well, this is this is there twice because there's extra coverage there. But it, that's sometimes difficult to do. When you've got the whole chromosome there, it's, it's far easier to spot these things. So we actually found that, that this has been in there, that chromosome twice for some reason. So that's over there. But also, he was able to find all the VGRGs. So there's one that's right next to the core uh, cluster, which is expected. There's always one that's right there with the rest of the protein apparatus so that you, they're sure to load up one VGRG and an effector to be able to use this multi-protein complex that it's making on the, the surface. And then there's a whole big cluster at the top of the, the screen there. And then one, an orphan one all off on its own. We also then looked at the type six secretion system um, in the other isolates. And we, what we have got are then two different types of type six secretion systems in our isolates. We have the one in the first KU isolate, which is the one we have the min-ion sequence for, present in several locations of the chromosome. We've got the two locations for the core um, genes for the proteins that make the type six secretion system, and then the VGRGs that are scattered on the chromosome. But when we look at the other Kingston University isolate and at the Royal Holloway isolate, so these are all nice serious subflava, those other two subflava have got all of the type 6 secretion core genes in one location, one chromosomal locus. The, these two types, they differ the sequence level as well as their organization. So it isn't just that this one chromosomal locus got split, there was a chromosomal rearrangement that caused that to, to be split and to put be put in two slightly different locations. These are different on the sequence level as well. So it looks like when the type six secretion system entered the Neisseria subflava, <coughs> pardon me, it did so from two different origins and it's, it's come into the species from two, two different um, two different species or from two different um, lineages. So we've got these two different types here um, going on. And that's just in our in our three isolates there. So we are doing uh, the min-ion sequencing at the moment <laughs> of these other isolates. So we can see uh, more clearly what the VGRGs are there. And we can see if we've got any other weird uh, copies and things going on in, in those other two isolates as well. When we do a more broad analysis of some of the other sequences that are present um, in the, the public databases in PubMOST and in the NCBI, we can see that those two types of type six secretion systems exist in some of these other genome sequences as well. And they fall out quite nicely in the phylogenetic tree. So we've got type one and type two type six secretion systems. And we've actually renamed these because they're a bit clunky to call them type one type six secretion system and type two type six secretion systems. And we've had um, recently, we've had a, an online meeting actually with um, Chris Tang's group who are also looking at type six secretion systems in one of their isolates, um, which um, they, they've got a publication coming out soon that, that describes that. So we're going to do some analysis, share some of our analysis with them. We're going to make sure that our terminologies um, all line up to make sure that uh, there's no confusion in the field about type six secretion systems in the Neisseria. And then we're going to, to um, uh, be looking at what we can do together for the type six secretion systems going forward. So there's lots of data and there's still much to investigate. So we have two isolates from Kingston University students, and those two were Neisseria subflava, but they were two very different isolates. They are different in their capsule loci, they're different in their type six secretion systems, and they're different in lots of other ways. So we, when we align the two of them against each other in MAUV, they're very different from one another. And we have two isolates from a Royal Holloway student. One is Neisseria subflava and one is Neisseria cinerea. The Neisseria subflava isolates all had capsule loci, which were all slightly different in their serogroup defining sequences. One of the Kingston University Neisseria subflava isolates has sequences for a different type four secretion system than the one that's in the gonococcal genetic, gonococcal genetic island. 
And the three Neisseria subflava isolates all have sequences for type six secretion systems, but they're two different types. So all of this work involves lots of Kingston people. So lots of people from Kingston University, um, including a PhD students, Alan Calder and Jude Minkiti, and then a whole host of students who have done projects with me. Now these are students who've done master's projects who are on taught master's programs and have then done their project work in the summer students who are undergraduate students and do their project work during the regular academic year and some visiting students as well who've done um, work with me um, and also uh, at, when we did the first recruitment of students um, we had some administrative support so lots of support from people at Kingston University who have, have helped out with this study. And those are some pictures of what it looks like at Kingston University when it's it's nice and warm and sunny, which it has been for the last few weeks. Uh, we're, on, we're on the Thames. So the Thames running through London, um, starts out kind of in, in our end and then goes through down through Parliament and Big Ben and all those pictures that you typically see in movies of London. In the center there is a picture of Hampton Court Palace where the Thames runs past and that's where Henry VIII liked to spend time outside of central London in, in Hampton Court Palace. So that's right near us and Kingston University. I mean, there's parts of Kingston University you can look out and see the park that is near Hampton Court Palace. I can't actually, you have to go across the river to get there from our university. So thank you everybody. Thank you so much. It was wonderful talk um, and a lot of information, a lot of sequencing data. <laughs> so uh, may I ask one or two quick questions? Of course. The organizers permit. So these uh, new strains that you got, Kingston yes. strains as you call them, or the other one. So, um, did you find in this secretory system any specific domains or regions which you could ascribe to drug resistance or uh, causing that change in morphology that you observed in your cultures? So one of my PhD students is specifically looking at drug resistance differences in these isolates. Um, so that's a bit that's it's still ongoing. Um, he's done laboratory experiments to look at drug resistance differences and then he's comparing it to what he's seeing in in the genome and genotype so that's still an ongoing analysis to looking at, at drug resistance but there's not anything that's come up that's given us any concern as far as high level resistance from these so there's not anything that's come out is is very concerning at this point now Okay. And we did ask in one so, of our surveys whether any of these students had had any recent antibiotics. And, and for the, these two students, they hadn't. Yeah. Because normally that is one of the mechanism, the secretory system is one of the mechanism which most of the pathogens use to uh, efflux the drugs or their metabolites so that they are resistant to that. So. So even the having a type six uh, secretory system did not uh, was not cannot be ascribed to the drug res resistance. You think? Yeah, I don't think the type six secretion system would be involved in increased drug resistance. Um, I th would need to look at whether. I, I think um, I think Jude is still looking at what the the other efflux. AFUX pump systems look like in these isolates in comparison to things like the MTR system and the FAR system and, and things like that as far as efflux pump systems. Other others can ask questions. I'm I'm I have Okay, Professor Laurie, I was uh, just curious because you said that uh, from the Kingston University, both the species that is same, that is nice area subflower, right? But they were yeah. different morphologically and other differences also you found. So is what can be the possible reason? Because genome is same, uh, the chromosome is same, then uh, what can be the reason? With, okay, antimicrobial resistance, I understand there can be some 
uh, over expression of some genes or some efflux bumps or something like that but morphologically being different apart from the face variation you said that they are different like so one was smooth one was rough and uh, there was a glandular secretion pigmentation was there so what can be the reason so they they are they're simply very they they're different isolates um and they they are different they they are just different examples of the same species that were co-residing in the same person at the same time i mean we we even see this with the pathogens you can get um someone who has a a neisseria gonorrhea infection but what they actually have are two different neisseria gonorrhea that are infecting them at the same time and when you genome sequence the, those two Neisseria gonorrhea and align them, you actually find that those they have two gonorrheas that are infecting them at the same time. So it just happened that this person has two Neisseria subflava that we captured at the same time. They could have also had a Neisseria lactamica there and a Neisseria cinerea there, but we didn't catch it with the throat swab. <laughs> it's just by chance what you catch. <laughs> Well, the student's yeah. holding still. <laughs> right. Okay. So Different strains, actually, of the same uh, species. Different yeah, strains of the same species. Yeah, they're just, yeah, yeah, very different. And they two are residing together, helping each yeah, other. Yeah, in fact, together. in, in Nyseria, they, it is known that there are a lot of variants. Mm -hmm. Morphologically, you can, you know, you can classify them. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so there are a lot of variants. Okay, so we have questions from the students. Uh, one of our students, Aman, he is asking, can these secretion systems in pathogenic strains be potential drug targets? Is there any other function of these secretion systems other than reducing niche competition? Yeah, you told that uh, they can attack the fungal cells, they can attack other bacteria. That's yeah. Okay. yeah, so they, they have been... Uh, hypothesize that they could possibly be drug targets. So you're right there. Um, they, they've been investigated from biotechnology standpoint as whether they could be used to deliver drugs. Um, so they've been looked at in that aspect, whether they could target and deliver drugs into host cells, for example. Um, probably they're, they're looking more for something like a type 3 secretion system, but they're looking at type 6 secretion systems for that as well. And they're also looking at because type six secretion systems have already evolved to take out competitor bacterial cells. Can we use them to do that? Can we use a type six secretion system that if we discover a type six secretion system that will take out a nice area meningitis, can we do that? Can we develop a type six secretion system on a harmless bacteria to be able to stop meningococci? So something like that. Are we able to to manipulate these types of excretion systems so they would attack a, a multi-resistant bacteria and destroy it and not destroy us? Uh, but they also attack the, uh, the, the eukaryotic cells, right? The human cells probably, they can also do attack the same way. Yes, so maybe do. preferentially attacking cancer cells. OK. Yeah, Del targeting the delivery of, of a cancer drug or targeting the destruction of a cancer cell. So this another one question from or the fungal student. cells because antifungals are finding something that that will attack a fungal cell preferentially and, and not cause a toxic effect on our cells can be quite difficult. Maybe dose difference will be there. What dose yeah. is affecting fungal cells and what dose is affecting the R cells, eukaryotic cells? can be worked out then it will be a good thing maybe so another one of the students suesh he's asking what is the role of the 12 base pair sequences that are specific to Neisseria species do they mediate some sort of communication how does their transfer take place so this is something that was a mystery for quite some time we knew that there was this 12 base pair sequence that was involved with uptake and we knew that if you put this 12 base pair sequence into your DNA, you got more transformants. 
So we knew it was involved, and we knew that if you if you used it as a molecular biology tool, you'd get more transformants. So we we knew that, but what we didn't know for a long time is what receptor there was on on the cells. Um, but then um, Igor P Pelilic. I don't know how to say his name, <laughs> um, but uh, at Imperial University, he actually worked out that there there is a receptor on the the cells of Neisseria that recognizes this um, this 12 base pair sequence and the little variants of it as well, and um, is able to then preferentially take up this DNA using the the, the pillus mechanisms to and and the competency mechanisms of Neisseria to take up the DNA into the cells. So, so as long as the bacteria are naturally competent for transformation, um, which most of the Neisseria are, there are a few that, that aren't very good at it, but most of the Neisseria are. But th those few are just outlier strains that don't seem to do it very well. Okay, so there's another question from Nilesh. He's also asking the same about the difference in strains. He's saying, did you find any small differences after sequencing analysis of the strains you found at Kingston? or they were completely aligned to Neisseria subflower species? Oh, there, there are differences. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but we, we see that quite often with Neisseria. There are differences. Even if you, if you take the, the bacteria and you grow them in the laboratory for some time and then you resequence them, you'll see differences. And that could be because the, there's been a phase variation event or there's been a chromosomal rearrangement or there's been some, some slippage in the replication of the genome. You'll see differences. But then when they're out in their natural environment and, and you're getting them over a, a time period or over a period of time in, in a person, then you do see a lot of difference. So, so we've, we see this great variety of genome sequence data looking in the public databases, looking at PubMed LST and NCBI. And, yeah. So did you, I since there is no question I see in the messages, can I ask one more question? Of course. Uh, is there, did you also look at the plasmid variation because Neisseria has large plasmids. So did so you one look at the, their sequences? One of the things that we can see in the, the min-ion data, you get the, the full chromosome, but then you get little packets of the other stuff that comes out. So that's one of the things I'm encouraging one of my PhD students to look at. Well, what about that, those other little circles? Can you tell me what's on those as well? So yes, I, I am anxious to, and keep kind of reminding him. He's very focused on looking at the type 6 secretion system. So I think I probably need a, a project student to just tell me what those little circles right, are. Right. I think because one of them is, is quite clearly a plasmid. And another one might be a little bit of um, maybe some recombination event that's happening with the VGRG because it's a VGRG and an effector. So it might be something that we've captured a bit of recombination event. Because of course, every time you sequence, it's, it's a snapshot what's happening inside those cells so you get these strange yeah. kind of events yeah. that are happening you can sometimes True. you can see an inversion event happening where a bit of um a bit of your sequence doesn't quite align and the alignment doesn't know what to do with it so it just makes it a contig and then you and your brain have to work out what's happened and of course what's happened is there's this is an event that then doesn't align anywhere and you have to kind of do a little brain tweaking to work out that's what that was yeah <laughs> Because a lot of resistance, drug resistance, as somebody was asking, was actually uh, is also plasmid mediated in, in Neisseria and in many yeah. other bacteria, actually. That is true. Any more yes. questions, Meenakshi? Uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah, one more question has just come. In fact, two are there now. So one of the students, Redhima, she's asking, while doing species identification, you found quite ambiguous results, like for KU isolate 2, it came to be N mucosa, mucosa. So did you find any particular characteristic, characteristics of those species as well? I think when yes, you named that yes. So one of the analyses did suggest it could be mucosa. So when we see mucosa in the lab when we're growing it on a plate, we can tend to tell it's mucosa because it's all mucusy. It looks like mucosa. It's all yeah. <laughs> and it didn't look like that on the plate. So when the the sequence results came up and said mucosa, I kind of went, it's probably not mucosa. <laughs> Does it look like mucosa? And and the students were like, what do you mean? It was, it was, show me the plate. No, that doesn't look like mucosa to me. So I didn't think it was probably mucosa. Plus, none of the other sequence results suggested it was mucosa. 
And when we did the phylogenetic tree and when we did the mauve alignments, we did try a mauve alignment with, against mucosa and it didn't look as nice as lining against a, a subflava. So we were pretty solid with our, our hypothesis that it's a, it's a subflava. So, so that worked out really well. Yeah, having previously worked with some well-defined commensal species in Bill Schaefer's lab and seen what, what these look like on a plate kind of helped as well with knowing that, you know, mucosa is called mucosa for a good reason. It looks like someone's spit a big mucus ball on a plate. <laughs> yeah, so no more questions because this is the one last question. Did you find any chromosome rearrangements in your analysis? That is what has just popped up and you have already talked about this. Yeah, so I, I did have a summer student who worked on the complete genome a little bit, looking at um, things like GC skew and looking at things that looked a bit funny. And we did have a bit of the chromosome where she said, that does look a bit odd. Can we look at what that is? And what she found was that there's a, a prophage that's been inserted into the chromosome, and it kind of throws things off a little bit. Um, so we started looking at that, um, but then her project has ended. Um, so we haven't haven't done a whole lot of investigation. But when we do look at the mauve alignment between our subflava and the other um, reference subflava, we don't see that there's been um, things where where stuff is kind of inverted the other way around. So any gross rearrangements. But I think it it would be interesting to look at um, anything that that might be in more finer detail. So in particular, we did some work looking at the Correa repeat enclosed elements. So these little Neisseria specific elements that are, they're not IS elements, but they're more, they're smaller than an IS element, but they otherwise have characteristics of one. And they can themselves invert. And it would be interesting to look at the raw data to see if we can see any of those inversions happening or any um, any other rearrangements or inversions or things happening, phase variation events. Um, and that would just require some more time and some more people to do that. Uh, we have one more question, Minakshi. Uh, okay. The Vanda student is not able to type in the chat box, so she has sent me a message. So uh, this is from Vernika. She says, as there are many uh, common and sharing features among these in these area, uh, Nigeria species, so can there be any common target which can help eradicate or control these pathogenic species? Yes, yeah, so eradication of these species has been um, something that's been d debated and discussed for quite a long time. I, I can remember um, we were at a Nigeria conference many years ago, and the, the, one of the discussions that was happening was about the meningococcal vaccine and how great the, the advances in the meningococcal vaccine were. And and then um, w one of the, the, the elder people in, in the gonococcal field stood up and said, yeah, you know, we should probably get working on that for the gonorrhea. And he was being, he was joking because, of course, we've been trying to do that for, for Nicaria gonorrhea for literally decades. And one of the issues is, of course, that a person with a gonorrhea infection can be reinfected with the same gonorrhea strain over and over and over again because our immune systems don't learn what a gonococcus looks like, even the same strain, because they can change their surfaces so dynamically. They have so many ways to, to do antigenic variation, to do phase variation of the things that antigenically vary, that, that they just change everything on the, on the surface. They just keep changing their clothes. <laughs> so we don't know what they look like. Um, and I, that's that's one of the major issues, I think, with with trying to be able to, to eradicate a pathogen like Neisseria gonorrhea. Um, I think for something like the commensals, we don't necessarily want to, to eradicate a commensal, but one of the other theories that people have been looking at is, can you get something like a meningococcus to, to behave itself so it never invades and it just goes back to always being a commensal always goes back to just being a non-pathogen because the issue was about 200 years ago it took on these traits that made it pathogenic that made it invade go past the blood brain barrier go into the blood and be the horrible pathogen it is but if it could just stay in the nasopharynx then it wouldn't be bad and if if the gonococcus i don't know <laughs> could behave itself as well in, in my note yeah it's a bit of a different story, I guess, than the nicer you manage it is. But yeah, that is the issue with the gonococcus. It just keeps changing. 
think not only in Nigeria, all the microbes they need to behave. In they need fact, to behave. Also. They behave themselves. You know, <laughs> you know, E. coli most of the time in in our guts is is all right. It's only those those the ones that picked up the bad traits. Yeah, and the most misbehaved. Yeah, some kids. <laughs> Highly misbehaved. Yeah. So it's kind of shit. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so can we target something which is leading to these variations, you know, the antigenic variations or, yeah, so something like that, which can probably be a target, like the splicing thing, right? So can that those things be targeted, right? Okay. I don't think there's any more question, Manakshi. Yeah, yeah, just one ask. one more question. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Just a second. One more question came from the student. Yeah. So she is asking: Is there any change in the mechanism of type six secretion among two phenotypically distinct Neisseria subflower species that you got? So we're looking uh, right now at the the phenotypically what's going on with the type six secretion systems because of the delays with with not being able to be in the lab because of all the lockdowns. Um, Alan's been trying to do the experiments, the competition experiments that you do with the type six, show their functional, show what they're doing, show who they're competing against with those experiments. So a lot of our work on the type six has been bioinformatics based at this point. Um, and he's just now getting at looking at what type sixes are able to compete and what they're they're able to kill with their d two different type sixes. So we're hoping to to have some results quite soon looking at the first Kingston University isolates type six and, and what it does with it compared to the second Kingston University isolate and what it does with it and whether they're able to kill each other. So was is there a little war? Were they from different parts of this the 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 sweep with throat swab? Um, whether each either of them is able to kill any other Neisseria, what other species in the throat they might have been able to to attack, what sort of toxins. But looking at the from a bioinformatics standpoint, looking at what they have for effector proteins, so those toxins that they secrete, they've got completely different repertoires. So they're secreting different things and they've got different immunity proteins. So they do have a different arsenal of weapons at their disposal from the from the two different systems. So now one of our faculty members, uh, Dr. Manisha, she wants to ask some question. Ma'am, you can go ahead. I uh, um, I wanted to know, like you worked on uh, four species of Neisseria, that is Neisseria subflavus and Cinaria. So um, and you found two types of uh, T6SS. So did you try in Neisseria, Gonorrhea, and uh, what is other, meningitis? What type of uh, this T6 uh, secretory system they have? So we haven't found any type 6 secretion system in any of the pathogens. We've done extensive okay. look th through the databases and, and all of the genome sequences from the pathogens, and none of the pathogens have them. We can find them in commensal non-pathogenic species, but we can't find them in any of the pathogens. Which is, so is interesting. it's a good thing that you can just use as a difference. <laughs> yeah. That's a good. And also, yeah. So did you try in more number of isolates because you just did in four? It just a theory. So we the four the four that we sequenced, but we've then taken our analysis and our discovery of the type six from those four and expanded that out to look at lots more isolates and look at the variety of different type sixes and the variety of different effector proteins. So the analysis that Alan's done from there, particularly as having lots of time at home only on a computer, he's done a lot more analysis um, from there, okay, but I'm yeah. kind of leaving that story for Alan to, to put into a paper <laughs> hopefully soon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I think there are no more questions from anyone. So, That's um, a great question. <laughs> yeah, very exciting talk. <laughs> thank you. So, a lot of questions. <laughs> So now may I request Dr. Manisha to give an official vote of thanks to Professor Lori for such a nice, you know, interactive and lively talk, I should say. We were full time, we were enjoying the talk. It was really great. Science should be fun. Uh, yes, science <laughs> should be fun. I do agree. Uh, thank you, Dr. Minakshi and Dr. Aparna for organizing such a nice lecture today. And um, Above all, it was uh, such an interesting and informative lecture by Professor Lori. 
and as we can see that you just started with very basic lab investigation techniques uh, and going uh, all bit towards the genomic sequences of nisseria and uh, i think it was a very simple and understanding especially for our masters and phd students and as we could see from the number of questions uh, one can see that uh, nobody was feeling bored and it was such an interesting and motivational lecture you gave today and you have done a, such a nice work as you presented from your masters and phd students so good luck to you as well and thank you so much for today thank you thank you thank you and good luck to all of you as well yeah thank you yeah, with all of your various projects and everything you're working on yeah daman ma'am so you are you are you are mute daman ma'am you have to unmute uh, yeah unfortunately we are not having std um conference this time it is online only otherwise maybe we would have met <laughs> well, we met now. so <laughs> yeah we have met now of course so great uh, great talk and great work uh, best of best of luck for your future endeavors thank you thank very you. much for coming thank you thank, thank you, you ravi thank you everyone. so much ma'am thank you so much ma'am thank you Thank, and, you, Ravi. Uh, thank you, Ravi, thank you, Ravi, for inviting Professor Lori. Thank you, uh, thank you so much to uh, all of you, ma'am, uh, for giving me this opportunity to invite Dr. Lori. Uh, she has been kind enough to uh, accept our invitation, and we really are glad to have her here today uh, to deliver his wonderful talk. And I also would like to congratulate Dr. Lori. Uh, for the huge success of her newly released book bacterial genetics and genomics uh, which is which is having uh, you know a huge information about the bacteriology and especially about nisseria uh, so congratulations dr lauri and thank you so much once again uh, hope to see you uh, next year in the nisseria conference if if this pandemic gets over hope for that thank you thank you thanks Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining.